highlighted verse today. It's going to be found in Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Say amen. amen. Isaiah 40, 31 is one of those famous favorite passages that we cannot read or hear enough because of the encouraging promises that God gives us. A lot of times, just the reading of that verse itself sends a whole church up in praise, knowing that if you wait on him, he will renew your strength, those of you who may be experiencing weariness on today. The problem, however, is that too often we read the great text without fully understanding the context. As a result, we lose some of the meaning which God intended for us to get. For that reason, I want to take some time, a few minutes, just to ponder the passages preceding Isaiah 40, 31, so that we can appreciate and appropriate God's great promises. The immediate context is Isaiah 40, verses 25 through 30. But if you ask me, it really starts with verse 1. Um, and when we read the, the, the scriptures uh, prior to our 31st verse, we hear this. To whom then will you liken me that I shall be his equal, says the Holy Ghost. Now this is Isaiah, one of the major prophets, um, uh, uh, speaking uh, um, on behalf of God, uh, presenting the message, the voice of God to the people of God. And this is the question, to whom then will you liken me that I should be his equal? This is God talking. Sounds mighty, mighty bold. You know, we always talk about how gentle he is, how kind he is. But there's a part about God that we all need to know. He knows who he is, and he knows who he is in comparison to us. One of the scriptures in this chapter says that we're just like grasshoppers. Now, when the spies were sent up to the promised land, they came back with the report that they saw themselves. But what God is saying here is, yeah, now you really are like grasshoppers because he is such a force. And so as we continue to read the scriptures, um, uh, verse 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. Look, look in the skies at nighttime. You know, I, I often have wondered, and here in the past three years, I'm like, God, it had to be a God. Who, who, who would even think that there is no God that put the stars in the sky? And I don't know how long they've been there. They've been there eternally. Because, see, eternally just does not represent what we see in the future, but it represents what has happened in the past. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning, and he is the end. So can you imagine that the solar system has not lost one beat in all th of eternity. Who else could have done it? We have the, the experts, the brains trying to search out and discover what is. And the God that is put it in place. So he is pulling up his record. Say his record. So he wants us to lift up, consider of uh, the stars, the one who leads forth their host of uh, by number, God is able to call a star by name. Because of his greatness, of his might, and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Could you ever imagine such a responsibility? Think about it. Why is it so important that we understand who God is? Because he's the one who stands behind the promise that was given in Isaiah 40 and 31. As we need first to really know him, we really need to know God and not just about God. You know about me, but you don't really know me. You have not spent enough time with me to know me. Only those who have walked closely with me, because how many of you know 
that even in looking at Facebook and Instagram, you think you know those people, but they show you their best part. I know I do. If, if a picture is taken, everybody in here knows, and I'm going to say, let me see it. Let me see it before you do anything with it. Because if it doesn't look the way I want it to look, you're not putting it on Facebook. So we have a tendency to show forth our what? Best part. But how many of you know that our best part is not the only part? We have other parts about us that's not always the best. And only God knows that. So just because you come to church and you learn about God, you learn about his son Jesus does not mean that you know God. And so when, um, when God makes a promise, as he's done in Isaiah 40 and 31, you need to know something about the person, the God, who made the promise. Uh, someone once said that the promise is no greater than the one who promised it. Even though my, six, my almost six-year-old granddaughter, Imani, can promise me different things that I know she wants to do, but she's incapable. I cannot stand or, or, or believe in that promise, not right now anyway, not in this time, because I know her capabilities. And more importantly, I know her incapabilities. And so the promise is no stronger than the person who made it. So God is, 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 is doing, a, he's taking an opportunity to present himself as who he is, and I thank God for it. No shame in his game. Someone, uh, um, I, I know that the track record is so important for us to believe people. We have to stop treating God like he's our second cousin who promised to give us back money we lent them 10 years ago, and they're nowhere to be found. We can trust God. We can trust God's word concerning us. I married my husband over 42 years ago because of his track record during our courtship. Before I said I do. Women, if he breaks promises now and fails to fulfill 90% of commitments that come from his mouth, then my advice to you is to run, Forrest, run. And it's not always, it's not always the men, but it's the women too. So trust is built based on your track record. Everything that my husband promised me or said to me, and they weren't really promises, but you know, he, he, he proposed to me after knowing me for only three days. And he used John 14, the scripture, I go to prepare a place for you. Where I am, that I'm coming back and I'm going to get you and take you with me. And all I could do is say, uh-huh. <laughs> Everything that he said, he, he had the whole year lined out. And the thing that impressed me about Otis Lockett Sr. is that he did everything he said. I've never met a person like that. He promised me that when we got married, and this is on this side of marriage, he promised me that when we got married that we would tell you that he liked to walk through the parks. That has not yet come. I guess when I see him in heaven, I pray to God that there will be parts. But I learned to trust him because of his track record. By the same token, we must learn to trust God because of his track record. Now, trusting doesn't mean that they're going to do everything you say or everything you ask. Because in our mind, in, in, in our being, we are so far below who God is that many times we don't know what we need or what we want, but he does. And many times we find out that when he uh, does not answer the prayer the way we want to, he causes it to do what? To work for our good. It may not. It may not be what you asked for. But what he did, if you love the Lord, it's conditional. 
and you're called according to his purpose, then he will what? Cause it. It may not even have any attention of ever working for your good. But because we serve a God who governs everything, he will cause it to work for your good. Have you ever been in a situation where when it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out? And yet God took that uh, 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 this disappointment, that betrayal, and he caused it to work for your good. If you're in here on today, you need to stand and applaud the Lord. I know in my life he's caused many things to work for my good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who do what? Wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired they will walk and not become weary. I looked at the word walk and run, and biblically they mean different. I, I looked at it, it struck me, here you are running before you walk. And normally in our lifetime, in the natural, we say that you do what? You walk before you run. But in the, in the uh, context of this scripture, when we run, we are running for the goal. We're running the race. But when we walk, and, that, and when we're doing that, we are running for our what spiritual rewards. But when we walk, we are walking in the spirit. It is our everyday lifestyle. So we are running the race, and we are walking in this lifestyle uh, in our everyday relationship with one another. See, we have to walk in what God has called us to. We have to walk in what he has uh, called us to do and to become. And unless we know God, we'll never know the principles in which we are to live with one another. People in the church have relationship problems, even though they're saved, because they really have not uh, 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 tuned in to what God has called them. They're not walking in the spirit. They are yet walking where? In the flesh. And so when we walk, we are walking. This is, this is the thing that deals with our relationships. And this is where we have problems. You know, all of us want to get to heaven and walk on the, gold, out on the streets of gold and sing and never get tired. You know, we all want to do that. But we have a responsibility here. And that is to walk in the spirit and to be in tune with our sisters and brothers. Even when we disagree, we have to learn to do what? To walk in the spirit. So the question that is asked in uh, Isaiah 40, 18, um, it comes from God and he says, he, I mean, God is, is just on his throne and he's just, he's taking no shame in letting you know who he is. And so this morning, my main thing is to Feed you the word, and, get, and when you go home, you get your word and see who God says he is, if you don't know. And you begin to, to declare that. You, be, you begin to confess the word of God. And the more you confess it, the more you say it, the more you believe it, the more he becomes real, the more you know who he is. And so, um, the answer is resounding. There is no one like him. Say, no one like him. None is his equal. God identifies himself as the Holy One. The one who is separate from his creation. I mean, he doesn't even become a part of us, even though we, he connects with us as we connect with him. But as far as his greatness and his power, he is not a part. He separates himself from his creation and is to be distinguished from those he has created. So you just don't walk in calling him, bruh. He distinguishes himself. He demands respect. You can say what you want to say. Yes, he's good and he's kind, but he's not your bruh. He's not the man upstairs. 
He is the creator of your life. He is the creator of the entire being or whatever. There is none like him. Say, there is none like him. I was telling my son, I said, I was trying to envision, you know, he's been having the water and the stormy uh, uh, oceans behind him these past few weeks as he preached. And I'm like, now I wonder what are they going to, when I talk about God and his greatness, <laughs> wonder what can they put behind on this beautiful screen to, to, to liken it to God. And I heard the word nothing. Nothing. We use, we use, uh, the Bible says we use animals and people to, to compare God with the eagle, the strength of the eagle, the lion, we use that. But when it really comes, and, and, and those are his mere creations. So I was just wondering, what is going to be behind me on today? When I talk about his greatness, when I talk about his power, when I talk about the fact that he's separate from us. Hallelujah. And I thank God because even though he is separate from us, he abides among us. He abides in us. That thing is, can get confusing at times, but we have to know God, and we have to know how he works. Hallelujah. So it is important that we know the truth, say the truth, about the God. Because, see, we can make up our own truths about God. And that's what people are doing. I don't believe he meant that. That's just like telling one of your friends telling you, I don't think your mama meant she was going to give you a, a, a good beating if you, if you didn't come home tonight. Baby, you don't know my mama. And evidently, you don't know God. If you feel that he does not take what he does seriously and what his promises are to us, and many of his promises are based conditionally, we have to do something first. And then he comes along and he fulfills his promise. Amen. So now the Israelites were the first to receive this promise. They were worn out from their hardship. Now, you know that Israel um, was exiled from their homeland and um, during the uh, Babylonian captivity. And they took, and, and, and one of my favorite Bible people um, is Daniel. And Daniel was among those that were exiled from their country. And so this word is being spoken to the Israelites because it's been, do you not know that when they went into Babylonian captivity, they stayed in a land that was not theirs for 70 years? For 70 years. So what does that mean? That means that they had children there. Some of their children never knew what their home was about, what their homeland was about. And so these people are weary. Now, Understand that the word is wait. And if you need a topic for today, is wait for it. And in this scripture, it's telling uh, them, you know, to wait. That they're going to God is going to renew their strength. And and they, but this is a 70-year thing that they've been going through. And some have become, become so content in being in Babylon uh, until they don't even want to go back to their hometown. Some of them have grown old, been there 70 years. If you went there when you were 20 years old, that means you're what? 90 now. So why get up and move back? So I'm just going to stay here. So when we think about the hardships that they went through, they were in a government, and, and you got to know something about Babylon. Babylon was known as the center of iniquity, carnality, and worldliness. Does it remind you of any other place you know? Everything connected with it was in opposition to all righteousness. Do you feel sometimes that, that what we call righteous and holy people have turned it, have twisted it? Well, that was the case in Babylon. Uh, everything connected with it was in opposition to what God had said. And it was constantly leading men downward to the destruction of their souls. 
The Babylonians were, uh, uh, had many, many gods. They, they, they worshipped uh, golden images. They worshipped goddesses. Uh, anything they could think of, any subject matter, they would build a god. But, but, but you know, God has already proclaimed in, these words, uh, in the word before that he is God. There is no other god. How are you, gonna, how are you uh, 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 a grasshopper going to build something with a hammer... And then the metal, uh, the, the, the smith metal, I think that's what they call them, comes along and coats it with, with gold to make it look pretty. And you think, how could you possibly think that that would be a god? And yet the people were so weak-minded, they believed they were always creating golden images in their minds. And, and God, you know, he pokes at that. What, what you mean? How, how y'all going to do that? You know, you, you can't even, aff you can barely afford the gold. <laughs> and you're going to put it on a, a statue, on, on a piece, on, on, and, and call it God? So I love God. I mean, he's talking his stuff today. He's talking, he's talking in this scripture. But the Babylonians were so wicked. Um, we find, you know, even though we may be in our homeland now, we're in our homeland, um, many of us have found ourselves, just as the, the Jews, uh, in unwanted and uh, in unsolicited situations of life. You know what I'm saying? We struggle with overcoming disappointments and betrayals, and as believers, we sometimes ask the question, where's God? I, maybe I'm the only one that's ever asked that. God, where are you in this situation? And God was really silent because, you know, he uses nations to come against other nations to teach lessons. And even though Israel was his beloved, they were hard-headed, just like many of us. And so because they had uh, begun to look toward other gods, he said, okay, I'm going to show you. So over the 70 years, it was like a silent period. You know, there are times when I can pray, and it's like God is sitting right here. But then there are other times I can pray, and I'm, I'm saying, Lord, please come. Come, Jesus. You know, come abide, oh God. He's silent. Have you ever prayed, and you needed something desperately bad, and it's like God has shut the heavens up? He no longer hears you, and you, you find yourself praying the same thing over and over, and you get a little strength in one week, and you're praising the Lord, and then the next week, you're not even coming to church because you can't hear from God. But in the beginning of chapter 40, uh, according to the prophet Isaiah, he says to the children of Israel, he says, uh, uh, be, be confident, comfort. Uh, uh, God tells him to bring words of comfort. In other words, he says, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. And so we, hear, we see here that there is a breaking, a changing of what is to come. And so how many of you have received a prophetic word in your life? You know, that, that can be a good thing. And then on the other side, it, cannot, it can be a not so good thing. Because what it does, we hear that we've been delivered. We hear that we are being uh, sent back uh, to our homeland, but it hasn't come. And so we become more frustrated in trying to determine when rather than the purpose and the will of God. So sometimes I don't even want to know anything. Just, just let it happen because if you tell me, if you tell me at age 18 that I'm going to be a millionaire and I know I only have $10 in the bank, I'm up at night trying to figure out. See, this is what we do. We get the prophecy and we don't wait on God. So then we begin to figure out how we can make it happen. So I start trying to save $20 a week, and it never happens like that. And so the prophecy comes, 
that, uh, that uh, the Jews uh, are going to be set free, that they're going to uh, be allowed to go back to their, to their homelands. And, you know, as I said, it's been 70 years. And so the thing is that they need to do what? To wait. Um, so we found ourselves in that same kind of situation, asking God, God, when is our change coming? Anybody in here is praying that prayer right now? When is my change coming? We used to sing a song, hold out until, sing it for Walter, my change comes. And so, we, and then and after we sing it, then we go home and wonder, when is it coming? Thank y'all. Hit my key. So here we are in a place, we, we, you know, even in our homeland here in, in America, it seems as if we are going through the same kinds of situation as the, as the Jews went through in terms of the things that we would have been taught by the word of God and through the word. People are now saying that right is wrong and wrong is right and 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 I mean, you know, the laws are changing to the point where we have to, to do what the law says or, or else we're penalized. That was the case of uh, Babylon. You remember, that's why Daniel was thrown into the lion's den because they were trying to force their God and force their false religion and false practices on a man that was in love with the one and true God. And so we find ourselves in there, but tell your neighbor that he, he is delivering us from the system. And so what we have to do today is to look at the word of God and we have to trust his word. We have to trust his promise. And so what I want to leave with you today as I declare the, the word of the Lord over your lives is that we need to rejoice in the fact that God is eternally faithful and eternally just. Hallelujah. And see, we got his track record, not from what's going on in the future, but what happened in the past. That's the reason testimonies are vitally important. Share your testimonies of victory. Share your testimonies of healing. Share your testimonies of salvation. Hallelujah. And so we are understanding and we are rejoicing in the fact that we serve a God. That it's not just uh, uh, an imagined God, but a God that created us, created everything about us. We're serving a God. Hallelujah. And that he's faithful, y'all. He's faithful. From the beginning to the end, he is what? Faithful. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's the eternity spectrum. And so as we think about that and as we believe that, it is imperative that we understand that God is unchangeable. God is unchangeable. Psalms 145 and 3 says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. That's the reason when we say let's put our hands together and praise God, it shouldn't be anybody in any church sitting up here declaring that you are a believer and have a problem with praising God. Because if you have a problem with praising this God, you have a problem with this God. And I, I guarantee you're not his. But when you know God and when you know of his goodness to you, you when you know that when everybody else said no, he said yes. It shouldn't take the praise team as beautifully as they sing to try to pump you up on Sunday mornings or Thursday nights to get you to raise your hand and praise God. When we think about Psalms 150 and 2, praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Can you praise him on this morning? Psalm 66 and 3 says, Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe. Your enemies cringe before you. You can walk in the room and they could be just talking everything about you. But when you walk in, 
and you walk in with the power of God and he is your number one supporter. It doesn't matter what others are saying. It doesn't matter what others think. It doesn't matter if they call you crazy. It doesn't matter if they say you're a fanatic. But the fact is, you know your God. You know your God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So we just need to practice a little bit today. Rehearse who God is. Rehearse what he's done. Rehearse what he's been in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the thing that I like about it is that he's just not great in himself, but he's great for us. He's just not strong to impress himself, but he's strength in us. What good would, he, would it be for him to be strong and we never received it? But that's the thing that makes God great. Some of these other idols sit on their throne. They're stuck because they're just semen and they sit there. But our God is alive. Our God is creative. Our God is engaged. Hallelujah. So I encourage you on today to connect with God. The Bible says if you draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to you. I encourage you to connect to God. A connect to the powerful one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is strong for us. I like that. I like the fact that he's strong for us. And when I go to him in my weakness, hallelujah, and I present my petition before him, I present my condition of weakness before him, I know that if he hears me, he'll answer. And I thank God I don't go trying to put my strength up against what he has. See, when you go to the bank and you want to borrow thousands don't go there pulling out your $10 bill. You go in to get what they have. And so this is what we have to do. We have to go in to get the strength that God has for us. Hallelujah. Let him know I'm weary. I'm tired, God. What more can I do? What more should I do? I need you, God, because I feel a faint coming on. I feel a fall coming on, God. I need your strength. I need your help. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the thing about Isaiah 40 and 31 is clear that the covenant promise, say covenant promise. And if you're here, so you're part of the what? The covenant? The covenant promise is given to them that do what? Wait. The organ just went wrong. Because waiting is something we don't like. We don't like to wait in lines. We don't like to wait in traffic. I can't tell you how many saints have run people off the road because they didn't want to wait. Only to go down one block and turn into your driveway. We get anxious about waiting for test results. We get anxious and nervous about waiting for uh, 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 if we got the job or not. And you know, as people, we, we, we feel like, well, when you wait, that means you stop. But tell your neighbor, that's not true. Waiting is not passive. Waiting is active. You are actively engaged in prayer, in praise, hallelujah, you are actively involved in reading the word and reminding yourself. This particular scripture, the word wait almost sounds like a love language. When I was walking toward doors and my husband was with me, you know, and I'd go to grab for the door, he said, wait. I got it. We need to allow God to say to us, wait. I got it. And when he says, wait, don't go bursting through the door. I got it. No, 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 no. And that's how we mess up. That's how we fail and want to put it on God. 
But wait, the ability to wait is not passive. It doesn't mean you're sitting on your seat sleep, nodding, doing what you want to do because you know God can do everything. But when you wait on the Lord, that's the time when you get on your knees and you seek him. You seek the face of God. You seek the will of God. Hallelujah. Do we have any seekers in here today? Do we have any seekers in here today? Do we have anybody that's waiting on the Lord? Hallelujah. I want everybody in here that's waiting on the Lord to stand to your feet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. We need God to encourage us. I understand. I understand waiting is hard. Waiting is difficult. But if we understand the love language of God, what he's really saying to you is trust me with this thing. And how many of you have problems trusting God? How many of you have problems waiting for God? We all do, but today we are going to recommit ourselves to the love language of our Father. And he says that if we wait, if we wait on him, hallelujah, if we wait, he will, he will, he will do what? Renew, make new our strength. Allow us the strength to mount up with wings of an eagle. According to our knowledge and to our uh, a study, the eagle's wings are powerful. Hallelujah. They endure the storms that other birds fall to their death in. But if we wait on the Lord, he will allow us and give us the strength to mount up with wings like eagles. And the reason he compares us there is because he's going to make us strong for the journey. He's going to empower us for the journey. Hallelujah. And if you wait on him, you're going to be able to run and not be weary. You're going to run and not be weary. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you see me, I'm running. I'm trying to reach my goal. Hallelujah. You saw me back in 1973. I was running, trying to reach my goal. You saw me in 2020. I'm running still, trying to reach my goal. In 2012, when the Lord took my husband, you saw me running still trying to reach my goal yes lord yes lord yes lord hallelujah and that's that has happened because the strength of the lord has been with me the strength of the lord has given me the ability to run hallelujah and they shall walk walk in the spirit walk in the word walk in their faith and they won't faint you won't have to go and try to revive yourself throw water on your face Imagine you're not in a fainted position but you're in a position of holding on and waiting ah, ha, ha, ha. oh bless the name of Jesus bless the name of Jesus bless the name of Jesus bless the of Jesus, bless the name of Jesus. Oh God, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory to God! Yes, yes, and lastly, and I'm getting ready to take my seat. Well, I'm getting ready to go to my car and go to High Point. <laughs> But pastor preached a message. You know, when, when you're weak and you don't have the strength of the Lord, you become a complainer. 
because you only see what you see. But when you read the God, the, the word of God, he allows you to see what he sees. And even if you don't see what he sees, you depend on him to lead you. And so when you are weak and you're unable to grasp the goodness and the greatness of God, then you begin to complain, why me? Why my family? Why is this always happening to me? But I want to challenge and encourage you, rather than complain, proclaim. Proclaim who God is. Speak publicly, speak outwardly of who God is and what he is in you. If you don't tell it, then who will? If the believers don't stand on the word of God and declare the truth about our God, who will? Who will lift those hands to the Father? And let's begin to praise God. Let's praise God. We praise you, oh God. We praise you for our strength. We praise you for the power. We praise you, hallelujah, for the peace. We praise you, oh God, for the warrior, for the warrior that you placed on the inside of us. We will not give up. We will wait. We will not give up. We will wait. Say it with me. We will not give up. We will wait. Come on. We will not give up. We will wait. We will not give up. 